and welcome everyone to session four of our Healthy Aging series. Today is all about building bodies and balance, healthy aging extension programs. And today our guest speaker is Angela Flickinger and I'll introduce her a little more in just a moment. And this is our webinar team. It's a, a multi-state. We have UF5 Extension, myself, Wendy Lynch, Dr. Wendy Dahl, Julie England, and then from North Dakota State University, we have Dr. Julie Garden Robinson, and from Virginia Cooperative Extension, Dr. Carlin Raffi. Just some of our housekeeping information. We will have that certificate of attendance again at the end of the Qualtrics evaluation. You know, our surveys are short and sweet. Um, all sessions will be recorded, and so we will have that link available to you in the next few days. Again, please do complete that short evaluation at the end of today's session. And if you like today's session, be on the lookout for our next series, hopefully um, coming soon. And I don't think anyone needs many introductions uh, to the features of Zoom, but just in case, um, down at the bottom, you've got those chat features. Just click on that chat. We encourage you to um, send your questions, not only to our panelists, but also to our participants so they can get involved in that conversation. Quick disclaimer, any uh, information that's provided is for educational purposes only. Reference to a commercial product does not constitute an endorsement by the webinar team members or their institutions. And I am so incredibly delighted today that we have Angela Flickinger with us today. Um, she is a healthy eating active living program manager within the Institute of Health and Wellbeing for the University of Wisconsin-Madison Division of Extension. Angela is particularly interested in the intersection of health, best practices, and sustainable behavior change. The Healthy Eating Active Living Program supports extension educators with creating equitable systems, environments, and policies that improve and support individual, family, and community health. She's a registered dietitian, certified personal trainer, and holds a master's degree in public health. Additionally, Angela is the Strong Bodies Program, also known as Strong Women, Ambassador for Wisconsin. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Angela. Thank you, Wendy. And I'm making an assumption that you all can hear me. And welcome. I see that there is quite a few to, quite a bit of people on around all around the state. So good afternoon and welcome from Wisconsin. So we are gonna talk about the Strong Bodies Program and I move around a lot, so um, I hope I don't make you all dizzy. Um, but we're gonna talk about um, all about the program, the evidence kind of behind it, practically how extension in your own state can take on the program and get trained as a leader um, and some of the um, essential evidence behind it and then some of the also important components we've done in Wisconsin to sustain this community-based program. So um, I have to start with the blurb from Extension, right? So we embody the Wisconsin idea to um, partner and develop and connect research to educational resources and education in the community. And um, within the University of Wisconsin Division of Extension, um, the program area in which I live is the Health and Wellbeing Institute. And it's a new institute as a couple of years ago. And we have a program area, the Healthy Eating Active Living program, program area. Um, and, you know, our main goal and mission is to work collaboratively in communities to create opportunities for health. So today, what we're going to be um, going through, like I just mentioned, is kind of the situation and why evidence-based community exercise programs are essential, what extensions role can be in that, um, the health impacts of long-term participation in this program, um, volunteer uh, management and sustainability of health volunteers to do the Strong Bodies program, and then how to become a leader and find a program yourself. And then there'll be time for questions. I encourage you all, as you have questions as I'm talking, please feel free to pop them in the chat, and the Wendy's or Carlin will be able to um, get those to me so I can pause because I can talk and talk, but I would love to 
to know what you're thinking and feeling as we're going along so I can um, adapt this presentation for you all. So what is Strong Bodies? Strong Bodies is a community-based, evidence-based strength training program um, that's effective, safe, and structured, um, and based on evidence for middle-aged and old, older people um, to improve their health. Um, so the program in its evidence base is 18, 8 to 16 weeks, um, two times a week, although you can do it three times a week, so it's like every other day um, for one hour at a time. And in addition, to, in the extension spirit, we um, add health and nutrition education onto it. We've um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. So a little bit about the history of the program. So I would love to say that I created the program, but I didn't. Dr. Miriam Nelson out of Tufts University and Dr. Rebecca Seguin, who was um, a doctorate student at Tufts University at the time and now is um, faculty in extension with Texas A&M, conducted um, much research around strength training in postmenopausal women. And so if you've heard the program called Strong Women or anything, um, strong bodies, strong people, it's called different things in different states. Um, but it was originally called Strong Women because the, the research was based on women because there wasn't a ton of research um, in 1994 that was very specific to women and postmenopausal women, right? They usually took the, um, usually men in physical activity is where all the research lied. So she kind of filled, started filling that gap in research um, and of course, what they found is that it's super beneficial to exercise, especially strength train um, as middle and aging adults. Um, in Wisconsin, we call it strong bodies. Um, we of course don't want to genderize it in any way because we know it's um, super beneficial. Um, we also know women are more at risk for osteoporosis and um, some of the things uh, with aging because of menopause. So um, it's still mostly attended by women, but we do have quite a few men too. And so, so like the need, if you're justifying the need, we know that um, what, what the recommendation is and that, you know, what we all wish we did um, is that the moderate intensity aerobic activity, 150 minutes a week, and then muscle um, strengthening activities for all ages is at least two times a week and especially older adults to maintain what they have for strength. Um, and the stats around it, it's only about one in four um, adults fully need the, meet the physical activity requirements. And we, um, I think the data coming out of this COVID space and mess is that um, for some folks, there was an opportunity for more physical activity. And for other folks, um, especially parents, um, there was less opportunity for physical activity and for children. So we'll see that data coming out also. Um, we know nationally that only about six to seven percent of women strength train on a regular basis. Um, so that's a national statistic and I'm hoping in Wisconsin that number is higher because we've had this program but we haven't done any statewide analysis um, on that. And um, this is Wisconsin specific data but we know that most um, folks are not meeting their physical activity requirements and specifically the strength training that we're going to focus on today. And you all could probably tell me more than I can tell you about all of the benefits of strength training. So I'm just gonna quickly go through those, these, but we know that by strength training, um, and I'm not talking about exercising, so we know there's just glorious effects of exercising, um, but this is specific to strength training. Um, you can improve your muscle mass and your metabolic rate and your bone density and your function and your sleep and arthritis and pain and improve your mental health. And that leads to, you know, some of those health benefits of decreasing your risk for um, high blood pressure and triglycerides and lipids and diabetes and um, some sorts of cancer and osteoporosis. So there's the, the stuff on the left is more of the short term immediate um, things that happen when we start to strength train and some of these um, health condition reductions is because of long-term um, strength training. We used to think that as we got older, things just automatically happened. Um, and so we now know um, that a lot of this happens as we age because we become less active. So whatever hap is happening socially or psychologically, we become 
um, more inactive and we can decrease muscle mass and strength and activity and flexibility and bone density and balance. But those are all things that can be maintained if we're intentional about being active. Um, we, don't, we do know that as we age, some things just are happening. We know things happen to our bodies um, and with hormone shifts and with other things such as glucose intolerance or um, sleep problems and cognitive design, some things um, happen because we age, but a lot of things like on the left are things that we have a little bit more control over. And um, just to reiterate the fact that physical activity in general can prevent many of those um, chronic conditions. And ultimately saves a lot of money and goes upstream in preventing um, uh, medical costs. So um, I'm gonna show you some like very specific information about the research and data that's been done um, about this program in particular and about strength training. So if you've heard of sarcopenia, um, we know that as our muscles or as we age in our early 40s, we start to lose um, some of our muscle mass. And this is a cross section of somebody's thigh. So if you cut my thigh and tipped it over and you were looking at it, you can see that on the left is a young active person's thigh. It doesn't matter if they're young or old. Um, and you can see their femur bone is nice and healthy and it's about 80% muscle, 20, 15, 20% fat. So this is a nice healthy leg. You can see on the other side is a smaller thigh. So this person might have a size eight pants versus a size 12 pants or however you want to measure that. But you can see like 50% of their a muscle is, or 50% of their leg is muscle and 50% is fat. And you can see the bone um, shrinking down a bit. So this kind of just illustrates the contents of what is inside of you and how to maintain that muscle, muscle mass. So what we're trying to do is prevent sarcopenia as we age, um, which ultimately will lead to osteoporosis. And we lose muscle for lots of different reasons. Um, our metabolism changes, our hormones change, um, our diets can change, we can develop chronic conditions, so it can be a secondary to some of those. Um, and we know with females, there's a bigger shift in hormones, a, a more dr drastic shift in hormones that can affect um, muscle mass. And the consequence of losing that muscle is decreasing your metabolism, the marbling of the muscle, which is um, the increase of fat that's all, all in the muscles, um, trouble with daily activities and functioning, um, and increased risk of falls, which also increases or decreases your quality of life. So 54 million Americans have osteoporosis or low bone density. Um, specifically, 80% of those are women. So it affects women at a much greater rate. Um, and the stat that always um, is startling to me is about 50% of women will experience an osteoporosis related fracture sometime in their lifetime. Um, so one in two, which is pretty high, and that's the same um, rate of uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, uterine, uterine cancer, and breast cancer combined. So taking all of those cancers and combining them, um, you still have the same risk for osteoporosis-related fall. And this is what osteoporosis looks like. So as we age, um, if you've seen older folks in your family, your great grandmas and grandmas, um, you see that they can start to shrink a little bit. And that's usually because they start to get a, a curve in their back or a sway in their back and a little hump because the spine is starting to crush down and be compromised. The great thing about osteoporosis is it's uh, mostly preventable. So this is something you can be intentionally, you can intentionally strength train and keep that muscle mass up and that bone density strong. So in the, in the context of research, they did, um, Dr. Nelson did a randomized control trial for one year, and they had about 20 folks that were strength training for an entire year, twice a week, and they had 20-ish, 19 folks that were sedentary. And what they found was that over one year, muscle strength increased by 76%, balance improved, physical activity improved, bone density improved and their fat decreased. So 
as the fat um, decreased and the muscle increased, it, ironically, it was the same amount. I wish we could replace our fat cells with muscle cells. We can't, those are two different things, right? We can shrink down our fat cells and we can build up our muscle cells. And what they did after the trial was they brought back all of the participants, the 20 participants, and they were all mothers. They brought back their daughters and they did physical testing, um, fitness testing on the mothers and daughters. And in every single case, the mothers were stronger than the daughters after intentionally strength training for a year, which I think is also a good testament of um, the longevity in which you do it can really have some long-term impact. This is a participant um, that is local in Wisconsin. And I just put these stories in here to reiterate the individual stories that it, how it can impact folks. Um, and Sharon is actually a participant who had a triple, triple transplant on, on her lungs and two other organs. And she um, came to the program right out of physical therapy, was hardly able to walk because she had been bed bedridden um, for a long time. And this program got her back into functioning. Um, and she actually became a leader in one of our counties and has been leading the program for 13 years. So um, a great turnaround in health for her. So the other big thing that we know that is um, always affecting folks is diabetes. So 23% of Wisconsin adults have diabetes. Um, 34 mil million Americans have type two diabetes, which is the one we more likely can have a little bit of um, prevention around. And we have about 88 million Americans who are glucose intolerant. And we know that um, if you're glucose intolerant, if you don't do something intentionally about it, that typically just turns into diabetes. So it's kind of like being pre-pregnant. Um, there's really no such thing. You should be, you should be <laughs> stopping that, that um, wave of where you're going. Otherwise, we'll, you'll just end up with diabetes in um, six months or a year. And so they did another study. Um, and this was with um, all um, Spanish speakers, Hispanic men and women. And they took 50% um, of them. It was only 16 weeks. It was only a 16 week trial um, for three times a week. And they took um, 30 individuals who got usual care, which was diabetes, nutrition, education. And then 30 of them did um, strength training three times a week. Um, as a dietitian, I know I, you know, you would think the nutrition ed was super important, but we also know when people get diagnosed with diabetes, they get sent to the dietitian, the dietitian overwhelms them sometimes, and then they end up maybe not having sustained behavior change because they haven't changed their um, physical activity. Um, and what they found only after 16 weeks, which I think this is pretty significant, is that their muscle strength went up by 33%, um, their blood pressure went down, their belly fat um, went down, their muscle mass went up by about three pounds. Um, and most importantly, their hemoglobin A1C went down um, or improved by 12%, which is very significant, and their medications decreased by 72%. So if we could do healthcare, right, and we had all diabetes doing active strength or all diabetics doing active strength training, imagine the healthcare savings that we could have nationally if we could um, reduce medications and diabetes. And the tri third trifecta um, for chronic conditions and related to strength training is arthritis. So we know many folks have arthritis, especially as we age, um, it can impact anybody and any joint. Um, this is a picture of what, what it looks like, right? So on my, facing my side on the left is a healthy knee. So you can see there's a pad in the knee, you can see there's joint mobility. And then the one on the right, you can see that bone is touching bone. And so when bone rubs on bone, it gets inflared, inflamed, and flared up. And then folks don't want to move because it hurts. And then their muscles get weaker. So it's a real catch 22, right? You don't want to move too much because it hurts. And then when you don't move, you lose your muscle mass. So it's real important for folks with arthritis, especially knee osteoarthritis, to strengthen their quadriceps and their hamstrings and the muscles around their legs to create a natural space between those two bones so they don't um, rub together. 
And so they did another um, randomized control trial. And so this was about a four month trial in which after four months, so this is actually they had OTs and OT um, occupational assistants going into the home and doing this and strength training with these participants um, two to three times a week. And their strength increased after four months, which, which of course, if somebody came into your house for four months and strength trained with you, you'd be probably pretty accountable, which is awesome. Um, they were able to increase their chair stands um, and what they weren't looking for, but what they found is their pain reduction was 43%, um, which was very significant because that impacted depression and self-confidence and mood. Um, and then the physical function of the knee increased by about 44%. So their range of motion was in the 30s. And on the left is a picture of Dr. Nelson and her sister-in-law who actually has rheumatoid arthritis. And her goal was to climb the summit of Mount Washington. Obviously in the picture, you see that she has done that. And um, she was lucky enough to have Dr. Nelson as her sister-in-law. And with rheumatoid arthritis, it, she was bedridden for a while. So this wasn't something that she could just go and, and start strength training. She had to start with little increments and um, 10 minutes at a time, three minutes at a time. Um, but what she knows now in managing her rheumatoid arthritis is that her highs and lows, um, her lows are less deep. So she is able to manage it and not have to be in the state of bedriddenness because of her arthritis. This is also a picture on the right of a participant um, that is bowling, doing seven pin bowling. And she um, has said that she's able to stay independent because um, she's been strength training and she's able to do all of her daily living things because of how she's uh, maintained her muscle mass. And so the stories we hear from participants because it's a 12 week class and what we didn't like in anticipate as prevention educators is that we thought, oh, we'll do this 12 week evidence-based program. That's great. And then we'll walk away. What we didn't know is that we would start this 12 week program and then it'd be another 12 week program and then it'd be another 12 week program. And then we would have participants participating in the same 12 week program for 13 years, um, which is a good problem to have. Um, but also how as an educator in the community, how do you sustain that program? Um, and so when people started to really like, we knew that people had created kind of communities and were like, we're ready to do this. Um, and be committed to it, we had to quickly adapt to a volunteer model, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, the stories we hear are, you know, from I'm able to garden more or the first day when I go out to pull all my weeds, I'm not sore for a week afterwards because I'm stronger or I can shovel the snow um, without having to stop all the time or I can, this um, lady from Fond du Lac County shared that she's able to carry her 40 pound bag of, of water softener salt to her basement which she hadn't done um, for 15 years. So we hear stories like that, but they're so impactful, we know, for daily living. So in Wisconsin, um, we started this program in 2012-ish, 13-ish, and um, we've had 50 leader training. So we've trained other um, leaders around the state. We opened up the trainings to not just be extension folks. We made sure that um, we were marketing towards ADRCs and aging units and health departments and senior centers and anyone else that could become a leader. Um, and so we did this one day training for folks, uh, for leaders. And um, so we trained um, a little bit over a thousand leaders. Um, and people are doing the same exercises, which is great if they're getting stronger, um, but there's also a, an advanced program for folks um, to incorporate different exercises. And currently we have about 67, we've reached about 67 of the 72 counties in Wisconsin. Um, we also have a show on Wisconsin public television for folks to, to watch. Um, however, usually it airs at like three or four in the morning. So. It's a random time that it airs and I don't know how many people record it, but obviously there's people up because I always get calls the next day that they, they watch the show on public television. Um, 
Um, so our participation um, has been about 20,000 um, and that is unduplicated participants since we started the program in Wisconsin. And um, like I said before, 67 counties and three tribes. This map is of pre-COVID strong bodies participation because as we know, COVID had some impact on face-to-face um, -face programming. Um, so pre-COVID, we, we um, years ago, we decided to create a volunteer extension volunteer program around these peer leaders to support them better. So kind of like a community health model or um, supporting 4-H volunteers or supporting other kinds of volunteers, we created um, strong bodies volunteers in which they went to a training and then we had additional requirements to make sure, you know, they went, had all the pa proper paperwork and CPR completed. And then we were, we um, supported them at a county level um, to, and there was about 90 pre-COVID that we were supporting around the state that were teaching um, year round um, in different communities. We also, to um, create sustainability, we also created community partnerships um, with aging units and ADRCs and, and um, memos of understanding um, to use Title 3D and Title 3B funds. Um, so we were really able to benefit, um, use federal funds in a couple different ways to benefit both agencies. This is a Strong Bodies program we had with our Hmong community in um, the Fond du Lac area in which we have an educator um, who is his Hmong who leads it, and it's been just an amazing program. And these ladies make me smile every time I look at this picture. So people ask, what about COVID? Um, so we quickly turned the program um, by April or May after COVID um, became a reality in our state, we quickly turned it to virtual. And we trained about 50 leaders to teach it virtually and changed it up a little bit um, to mostly, um, of course, when we thought that it was only gonna be three weeks or four months or you know, a couple months thing, um, we went virtual. And then we realized all the past participants, we felt fine with them participating, but then we had a lot of new participants that joined us. Um, and the data is out yet if that it was an effective it was definitely an effective things for keeping people connected and keeping people active. Um, but as far as like actually increasing their weight and like getting a lot stronger, um, I'm not sure about that. And the research is out if that, if that happened. I'm going to pause right now. It looks like maybe my, my technology is going in and out. Is there any questions that are coming up in the chat, Wendy, that I need to address before I continue? Sure, there was one and I provided a resource on it and it was about stretching. And they said, is, is stretching considered a more mild form of strength training? If not, is it really necessary to do stretches if you do 150 minutes of aerobic activity in two sessions of strength training per week. So I can give my answer and Wendy, maybe hopefully the handout says the same thing. So stretching is important for flexibility and it's also great for mindfulness and other things. Um, there's not huge, there's not evidence that one needs to stretch before exercising. The evidence said that you need to warm up properly and have your body I'm warmed up to prevent injury and then you should exercise and then stretching is beneficial after exercise. So there's definitely benefits of um, stretching after exercise, um, but stretching in itself won't raise your cardiovascular respiratory rate to get those health benefits. Great, thank you. And I don't think there was any other questions, some good feedback and said great success stories. So here's a couple more stories of, um, so one of the Strong Bodies participants, um, she was in the original class and um, more so about the outcome of it improves socialization and, so, and decreases social isolation by having programs that are available in communities. And also um, for her, it gave her self-confidence. So we hear a lot about people just feel more confident because they feel stronger. 
And so this participant sent a picture in of her um, surfing in Hawaii. So she said she got up on the skateboard or on the skateboard, on the surfboard. Um, but mostly she attributed that because she would have never had the confidence to even try. And so I think that's pretty incredible if it, the, the face of aging is changing, right? Like I never saw my grandma or great grandma even on a bike. Um, but if we can show the next generation what it looks like to age as women, I think that's a pretty powerful thing. And generally, um, we know what the evidence says about the program, and we see that over and over, that their strength improves, flexibility, endurance improves, um, increased socialization. And long-term, we've done studies on long-term participation, um, where we've seen decrease in medications and decrease in medical costs and decrease in chronic disease um, or management of chronic con conditions. Um, this is again, one of our, our participants in Monroe County. Um, and she was quoting that she gained control of her life and discovered that her mind and her body are resilient. And I could tell you story after story after story in which I love and show you all the pictures of the amazing folks that have participated around, um, around our state. And I know we only have about 15 minutes left. So I wanted to leave some time for questions. And I wanted to also give a sense of what it looks like in the community. So once trained, um, we actually, um, there's optional fitness testing. And if we were all in person, I would you know, have you quickly do some fitness testing just to see where you're at and where your comfort level is. Um, the fitness testing, you can see this is what we do is a, a, a flexibility testing, strength and endur endurance, which these are you know, basic senior fit test um, assessments that folks do. And we get really good data because we can do it before class or after class or even um, longer after that. And so some of the exercises um, are that we do in the program, it's the same 12 exercises. So folks do the same thing. And the whole goal of the program is that they're using heavier weights. So they might come in and do the series of 12 exercises, which might, you know, is an arm curl and a shoulder press and some squats and some really basic, just like all around exercises or strength training exercises. Um, but we would expect that if they were doing um, shoulder lifts with two pounds for three weeks, we would expect that that by the end as instructors that we have them, you know, that they've increased their weights. So it's good to maintain strength for sure, but our job as leaders is to get folks stronger because you, unless we get folks stronger, we can't improve health outcomes. So that, that's kind of our mission and our goal is when we're in this setting is to get everyone stronger by the 12 weeks. Um, and then if they're at a, a goal where they're, you know, really doing some heavy weights and, and maintaining, that's when we would switch out, ex switch out the exercises to a little bit harder exercises. For instance, a wide leg squat, we would get trained in the advanced program and start doing um, a lunge instead of a squat. Some of the exercises are, um, like I said, shoulder press, wide leg squat, and then there's a couple balance exercises, which is a one-legged stork, which you can see in the picture, and also, um, and then we do some simple stretching at the end. And so we always, always also want to reinforce with our participants um, that individual behavior change comes um, it's more than an individual choice, right? We all want to exercise and be healthy and eat lots of fruits and vegetables, but you can't just will it into your life, right? We have to create settings and environments for people to be successful. And so by creating settings that are easily accessible and affordable in every small community and every space that's um, um, available to folks that we're creating spaces for people to do this um, with confidence. And so I'm, I'm always trying to get that policy systems environment, um, make many little health educators out of every um, participant we have in classes so they can better advocate for community, community change. And the key to um, 
obviously to, if you want health benefits is 12 weeks is great. So the evidence says, you know, even after eight weeks of a regular strength training twice a week, you're going to get a lot of benefits. But we do know that as you increase intensity and the progression and consistency um, of your practice that you're going to multiply the benefits of that. And so folks will ask, so what, what, how, what does it look like to start a program in a local community? So A, get trained as a leader. Um, B, folks can bring weights and equipment to class or you can, it's available. What we've found over the years is that, you know, people might start with like three and five pound and eight pound dumbbells or hand weights. Um, but if, if you're not providing um, tens and twelves in different weights, usually people just don't, they're not gonna go out and buy an extra two pounds as they get stronger. Um, so having those available is really um, improves people's strengths that are participating. Um, also the spaces that you need is just sturdy chair um, for a participant, um, steady internet connection if you're doing it virtually. Um, and ankle uh, hand weights and ankle weights. And then we do have adaptations where we get on the floor and do some exercises. And if folks are unable to get on the floor, they can do those standing up. Um, so we encourage folks to bring a mat or a towel if they are getting on the floor. The other thing you can expect from our programs is that um, some additional health education or nutrition education. So we have um, some brain health, um, curriculum, um, we paired it with Aging Mastery, which is uh, based on evidence, um, uh, 10 sessions. So we've, you know, added that on, we've added on um, some nutrition um, le lessons, and then also some health lessons around isolation and immunization. So we have lots and lots of like add-ons that we add and and education is really awesome, but when somebody's already in a stage of change where they're already invested in your health and you do education, you get a lot more bang for your buck. So we have really enjoyed seeing that. So I see a question in, the, in there that says, is this strictly volunteer participation? Um, could it be Prescribed, promoted by doctors, where was the class, senior centers or rec centers? This is a really great question. Thank you, Elizabeth. So um, we have done both. So we have opened it up to, um, if we're doing it in a specific place, like if we're doing it at a senior living apartment, so we'd open it up to the senior living um, apartment folks living there. Um, we've also had community classes where you just open it up and whoever comes, comes. We've also, um, this um, program in Wisconsin is approved by our SNAP Ed funding. So we're able to, as long as we have 50% um, food-wise eligible or um, SNAP ad eligible, we're able to do programs um, with all, all income audiences and in lots of different locations. We, in part of the registration, they need a doctor's note if they have risk factors for exercising. And that's been a really great tool to talk to um, doctors about the program. Because as we talk to doctors and then folks are coming back and they're seeing the health benefits, they'll say, oh, it's because I'm doing this program. And so it's really good marketing. Um, I actually had a physician reach out a couple, two weeks ago because we were doing Mind Over Matter, which is a bladder and bowel control program. We added it onto Strong Bodies and we had about 30 participants that signed up for that program, which is also an evidence-based program. And the and this was only after week two, I think, in the, in with, with that add-on and the physician was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe that um, her, her um, client was, knew all about, you know, um, how to do a Kegel properly and how to check on her stools to see how much fiber she needed. And she was strength training. She said, I've just never seen such a great turnaround in such a low time and wanted to know more about the program so she could um, send her other clients there. So I think that it's an awesome testament as a, pres a prescription program. And I think I can envision extension really digging into that, especially with diabetes and with other chronic conditions as a prescription program. So 
So as I talked a little bit before about the sustainability of it is that as we trained educators and as we trained volunteers in the community, we kind of, we didn't know what we were doing, of course, we were just going with it, right? So we created this, um, a lot of folks doing the program. Um, and then retrospectively, we're like, ooh, what about fidelity? And what about like, let's make sure liability statewide is in check because how our state runs, we have county funding on all of our educators. And so some of the volunteers are county volunteers or state volunteers. So we really tried to like wrap up our um, volunteer program into um, a program where it was more um, direct and with a checklist and we had a process around it. So we fumbled for a long time before we got to that place and we are just starting to get um, where we feel comfortable about, the, about our volunteer program. And then of course we went into this COVID space and so when we come out of it, we'll see what our volunteers look like, right? Has, are some of them like, nope, not gonna volunteer again. Will we have a, like a flux of a whole bunch of folks that wanna get trained as volunteers or leaders? Um, I think this is all new space that we'll, we'll venture through together. So if you're interested in becoming a leader, so there, um, so there's the National Strong Bodies Program, and Re Dr. Rebecca Nelson out of Texas A&M runs that as a nonprofit, and it's actually called Strong People. So she has a couple programs under Strong People, um, and you can find a program. So when I went to her website, which is on there, and you can have it on the slides, um, you can click by state and find a local program near you. And I see that Wendy Lynch. Um, is um, listed in Florida. So she must have sent her stuff into the national folks and that hopefully is updated. When you go to the Wisconsin link, it actually just takes you to the Wisconsin website in which we have all of our classes online. Um, so I think they have one link for Wisconsin and then they just push, us, push you through to the Wisconsin one. So that's how you found a program if you have folks around the country who might be interested. And then there's lots of program resources on the Wisconsin website and also the national website. And I just wanted to share that if you wanna poke around and look into it a little bit deeper um, or, or are curious about it, feel free to, um, to do so. There's also, if you're wondering like, well, what does it look like? What does the whole hour look like? It's not a secret society. Um, it's a pretty basic program. And um, Wisconsin Public Television um, did a video of us teaching it, which if I had a redo, I would like somebody else to be teaching it, not myself. Um, but that is available online also if you're, if you're curious. And then um, there's also availability to become a trained leader. So as extension programs around the nation um, are supporting this program or not supporting this program, you can well, we have a training in a couple of weeks, which you probably can't get into unless you're going to fly to Wisconsin really quick. Um, and then the national program, actually, I think they're launching, as last that I heard, they're launching some um, virtual online um, program or training. So they are looking to launch that. And I don't know if it's launched yet. It wasn't on the website a couple of weeks ago, but it could be now. Um, so if you're interested, um, feel free to reach out to me or to go to the Strong People website and reach out to, to Rebecca um, to get on a list. Or if you would like to invite somebody into your state and you have a group of 20 or 30 educators or community members that would like to get trained, please reach out. <laughs> 